Jesus Christ and in time prophecies from the book of Revelation. A series of study from the Holy Scriptures based on the book of Revelation by Mark Finley. Join us as we follow the vital topics that will be presented on this study, understanding God's messages and warnings on this last days of Earth's history. Jesus Christ and in time prophecies from the book of Revelation. What does the future hold? Where can we find certainty in a world of uncertainty? The book of Revelation provides hopeful answers for today, tomorrow, and forever. Join Mark Finley, author and world-renowned speaker, on a journey into the future with Revelation's Ancient Discoveries. Every chapter in the book of Revelation speaks hope. It speaks courage. It enables us to look beyond today to tomorrow, beyond the things of time to eternity. Revelation also challenges us. It challenges us in the depths of our being to look at what we have known in the past and compare that to God's word in the future. There are many traditions that have slipped into the Christian church. And in this presentation, we're going to look at one of those traditions that has come into the church and find out how God, as a loving creator, is calling us back to faithfulness to his word. Let's pray and ask the Lord to open our eyes, open our ears, but most of all, open our hearts. Father in heaven, thank you for the opportunity of knowing you. Thank you for the privilege of coming to your word. May its truth burn its way into our hearts. And give us the insight from your word, but especially give us the courage to follow it in Christ's name. Amen. Our presentation is entitled Revelations, Eternal Sign in Earth's Last Conflict. When you look out over our world, you have really one of two decisions. Either our world has been designed by a loving creator, a God that cares for us, a God that is ever present in our world, or this world has taken place by chance. It just happened to evolve. We just happened to be some speck of cosmic dust in the universe. When the genes and chromosomes came together to form the unique biological structure of our personality, well, they just happened. You see, there are only one of two positions. Either God created us or we're here by chance. Either we are intelligently designed or some kind of grand accident. When you look, though, out over our world, God has left his fingerprints throughout the universe. It's really difficult to see in this universe randomness, chaos, and lack of design. Everything from the rising and setting of the sun, from the incoming to the outgoing tides, to the delicately designed flowers and the fantastic orderly migration of birds, everything in the universe reveals order. It reveals design. Probably that design is manifest in the heavens as much as any place else in the universe. Now think about the heavens for me for a moment. Before the invention of telescopes, many scientists said there are about 5,128 stars up there in the heavens. Some might have said a little more, some a little less, but you could see that number of stars by the naked eye. Once telescopes were developed and they became much more sophisticated, it's very difficult to calculate the number of stars. In fact, one astronomer said this, there's about 10 trillion, did you get that? 10 trillion galaxies. How many stars in a galaxy? We're not 100% sure, but for example, if you take the Milky Way galaxy, there's about 100 billion. So if you take 10 trillion galaxies and you assume that there's 100 billion stars in each galaxy, you get a one with 24 zeros after it for the number of stars. I mean, it's a number far too big even to pronounce. The heavens are vast, but yet when you look into the heavens, you see stars and you see planets. 
whirling through space as great ballerinas. And, and there, in some orderly fashion, the earth revolves with the planets around the sun. The sun in its orbit, in this solar system, travels in a vast orbit. And all these galaxies and all these planets are moving. And there's some cosmic mind, some divine hand behind it all. Where there is design, there must be a designer. And where there's intelligent design, there must be an intelligent designer. The book of Revelation leads us to this all-powerful creator. Revelation chapter 4 verse 1 says, come up here. Come up higher to the throne room of the universe. And I will show you things which must take place after this. So God invites us into the inner sanctum of the universe. He invites us into the heavens. He invites us to his throne room. What do we find there in the throne room of the universe? We find a scene of worthiness, a scene of praise, where angelic beings and beings from unfallen worlds are worshiping God. You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. Why? For you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. Why is God worthy of our worship? Why is God worthy of our praise? Why is God worthy of our deepest affection and glory and honor? The Bible says, for you created all things. We did not evolve. We're not here by chance. We're not some cosmic accident. God created us. It says, you, by your will, they exist. That's all things, and we're created. You and I exist by the will of God. Did you desire to be a human being? Did you say, one day, you know what? I don't think I'd like to be a cow. That wouldn't be too much fun. Don't think I'd like to be a horse out in the field. Don't think I'd like to be a lamb frolicking and playing in the pasture. Don't think I'd like to be a mosquito that somebody swatted. Did you choose not to be a cow? Did you choose not to be a horse? Did you choose not to be a mosquito? You and I didn't choose that. We exist by the will of God. You see, my friend, before you existed in the womb of your mother, you existed in the mind of God. And God brought you forth into this life to have purpose and meaning. The reason we worship God, the reason we praise him, the reason we fall at his feet and worship him is because he has created us. He has fashioned us. He has made us. And in the book of Revelation, the revelation of Jesus Christ, he reveals himself to us as the powerful creator, as the almighty creator. So his creatorship makes him worthy of worship. That is the center of the conflict between good and evil in the book of Revelation. You either worship the lamb or you worship the dragon. You either follow Christ and worship the creator or you worship the beast. The issue in the controversy between good and evil in the universe is an issue over worship. In Revelation chapter 14, verse 7, fear God, that's obey God, reverence God, respect God, give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come. And in the light of the judgment hour, in the light of earth, the last days of earth's history, all men and women everywhere are invited to come and to worship the creator of the universe. Listen, and worship him who made, that is the one that created, heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of waters. So here is a call to worship the creator for all humanity. Has our creator left a creative sign of his love? Has he left a memorial of his creation? Let's go back. How do we worship the creator of heaven and earth? Let's journey back over time. Let's go back to the book of Genesis. Revelation is the book of endings. Genesis is the book of beginnings. So let's go back to the book of Genesis and see if God has left a sign of his creative authority, a sign of his creative love. Now, ours is an amazingly intricate world. As the world as we know it today was created in six literal days 
and God rested, according to Genesis, the seventh day. Our creator spoke and worlds came into existence, the sun, moon, and stars. Our creator spoke and the earth came into existence. As this earth came into existence, he carpeted it with living green. He planted magnificent flowers of pinks and reds and yellows and greens. What a marvelous earth it was when it came forth fresh from the hands of the creator. Imagine living in a world this beautiful. Imagine living in a world this magnificent. Imagine living in a world where the air is pure, perfumed by lovely flowers. Imagine a world where you have clear crystal water and fish swimming of different sizes and shapes and colors. Our God must have an amazing imagination when you see the created sea life that he indeed has made. Or think of the animals. He must have a sense of humor too to create birds like this with necks like that. When you think of the animals in Eden, together in harmony, in love, the beauty of Eden, the peace of Eden, the tranquility of Eden, no sickness, suffering, death, sorrow, heartache, tears, or heartbrokenness, and then God creates the human race. Genesis chapter one, verse 26 and seven, he says, let us make man in our image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. So the crowning act of creation is God's act of creating the human race. And the Bible says in Genesis two, verse one, thus the heavens and the earth and all the host of them were finished. What did God do when he finished his creative work? What did God do when the earth was complete? He stepped back. He looked at it and was refreshed and created the Bible Sabbath. Genesis 2, verse 2 and verse 3. The scripture says, on the seventh day, God ended his work which he had done and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which we, he had done. And he, God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it from all, because in it he rested from all his work which he had created and made. So God did three things on the Sabbath. The seventh day, God created an entire 24 hour period for all of his creatures to have fellowship with him. The seventh day given at creation was to be God's perpetual reminder of our roots. It was to remind us constantly that we did not evolve, to remind us perpetually that we came from the hands of a loving God, to remind us always that we have purpose for life and we have meaning for our life. Now, God did three things on the seventh day. Did you notice what they were? First, God blessed the seventh day. Now, somebody often says, is. Well, Pastor Mark, we can worship on any day, can't we? You can worship on any day and get a blessing. But if you really want the blessing of God, the blessing of the creator, the one who set aside this world, you have to go where that blessing is. Look, here's my Bible. What if I have seven Bibles? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Can you get a blessing any Bible you read? Sure you can. But what if I put a $10,000 check in this Bible. Would it make a difference what Bible you took, whether you got the check? Now don't worry, there's not $10,000 check in my Bible. But you see the point, if you want the Sabbath blessing, where must you go? where God put it. And where did he put it? He put it in the seventh day. The Bible doesn't say God blessed the first day, the third day, the fifth. Now God did something else to the seventh day. The Bible says he sanctified it. This word sanctify means set apart for holy use. It's like one man being married to one woman and uh, she is sanctified to him and he is sanctified to her. So in marriage, the word sanctity of marriage, one man, one woman set apart for holy use for that other. It's a, it's a holy bond of, of union. Let's suppose a couple just gets married and they are so excited about that marriage. They are sanctified in that marriage. 
set apart for one another. God uses that term in the creation story. He also says he rested on the seventh day. So we rest on the seventh day because God rested on the seventh day. There are some people that say, Is, are, isn't every day alike? But there's only one that God blessed, only one that God sanctified, only one that God rested upon. God blessed the seventh day by making it an eternal sign of his powerful creation and infinite love. So when we come to get the blessing out of the seventh day, when we come to worship on that day, it's not a Jewish Sabbath. Sabbath was set aside at creation over 2,300 years before the Jewish nation ever existed. The Jewish nation didn't come to the days of Abraham. You have Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the 12 sons of Jacob that make up the Jewish nation. But the Sabbath was given at creation 2,300 years before there was a Jew. So we come to get the blessing that God gave us. We come because he sanctified that day like one woman sanctified for her husband. Jesus that day wants to enter into a loving relationship with us just like a husband and wife are in a loving relationship. By the way, what if there was a marriage that took place, husband and wife are married at the marriage altar, and then they're getting ready to go on their honeymoon, just married, the car is all decorated, he gets in, and let's suppose his wife had six sisters, and one of those sisters gets in and cozies up and sits next to him and says, let's go. He says, what do you mean, let's go? I didn't marry you. I married your sister. And she says, one in seven. What difference does it make? <laughs> do you think it would make a difference? It sure does. Why? Because one woman was set aside. One woman was sanctified to that one man. You see, in the Garden of Eden, God set aside for all humanity everywhere, Adam and Eve were the parents of the human race. God set aside for all humanity everywhere the Sabbath. He blessed that day. He sanctified that day. He rested upon that day. God didn't bless or sanctify or rest on the third day, the fourth or the first. He rested on the seventh. Then as you look down the stream of time, you discover that in every age, both in the Old and New Testament, God's people were followers of Christ and followers, keepers of the true Bible, Sabbath. We find this too before the giving of the Ten Commandments. We remember the experience where Israel wandered in the wilderness, and as they did, the manna fell from heaven. God provided food for them. Isn't our God wonderful? When we have needs, he provides for those needs. And so, you see, in the wilderness, they are wandering, and Israel is wandering there, and God rains manna down from heaven. And what does he say in Exodus 16? Now, remember, the Ten Commandments don't come to Exodus 20. But before the commandments, based on the principle of creation in Genesis, Exodus 16, 26, six days you shall gather it, that's manna, but on the seventh day, which is the Sabbath, there will be none. So even in the falling of the manna, God works a miracle. If they were to keep manna over from one day to the next, it would spoil. Boy, they gathered it on Friday, it didn't spoil on the Sabbath, miracle number one. Miracle number two, twice as much manna fell on the Friday so that they would be able to gather it and keep it over the Sabbath. Miracle number three, none fell on the Sabbath. It was set apart. It was a blessed day, a sanctified day, and a day upon which the people rested and worshiped. Some of them, though, went out to gather manna on the seventh day, and what does God say? How long do you refuse to keep my commandments and my laws? Now, wait a minute. The law of God was not written on tables of stone until Mount Sinai. It was not written on tables of stone until God gave it to Moses there in Exodus chapter 20. But yet here, God says, how long do you refuse to keep my laws? You see, the Sabbath commandment was written in the heart and mind of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. 
the law thou shalt not kill was written in their heart and mind. The law thou shalt not steal or the law of purity. So the law was written in their heart and mind in Genesis. They kept the Sabbath commandment. But when Israel was led into Egypt and they violated God's command there through the force of their Egyptian taskmasters, God then wrote the law on tables of stone with his own finger. Now, when God wrote the Ten Commandments on tables of stone with his own finger, he wrote it on stone so it could never be erased. He wrote it on stone so that it would never be defaced. He wrote it on stone so that it would be a perpetual, eternal reminder of his commands. He wrote his commands with his own finger. Don't you think? That if the only thing in the Bible that is written with God's own finger is the Ten Commandment law, that it's pretty important? Don't you think that if the Sabbath command is written with God's own finger on tables of stone, that it must be significant? He didn't write it in sand to be washed away by the tide. He didn't write it on paper to be destroyed by the flames as they came in. Not at all. God wrote the Ten Commandments on tables of stone, not to be burned up, not to be washed away, but he wrote them on tables of stone as a perpetual reminder that they would endure forever and ever and ever. So the Ten Commandment law, God's commandments, in those commandments, God says in the fourth commandment, Exodus 20, verse 8 to 11, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. What's the first word in the Ten Commandment law written with the finger of God, never to be washed away, never to be consumed, to last forever? What's that first word, everybody? What is that? Remember. Why does God say remember? Because he knew that we would be tending to forget. He knew that down through the centuries, human beings and religious leaders in, a, in the early days of church history, in an attempt to unite church and state when the pagan tribes were coming down from the north, that those pagan tribes, and we'll study about this in our next presentation, who were sun worshipers, many of them, the Bible says that God knew that that would all take place in his far-seeing wisdom. So God said, remember, don't forget the Sabbath day. If God says remember, it must be important, right? If God writes it with his own finger on tables of stone, it must be important. Why did God say remember? Because he knew that the human race was likely to forget it. God said, six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work. Now notice, the Bible does not say the first day, the fourth day, the sixth. It says the seventh day is the Bible Sabbath. So the Sabbath is set apart by God as the seventh day of the week. All of the celebrations, the day before my birthday or the day after my birthday, would not make that day my birthday. Somebody says, well, does it make any difference what day you worship on? There's only one day that was blessed, one day that was sanctified, one day that God rested on, that's the seventh. There's only one day God commands us to keep. He says, remember the Sabbath day. It's the seventh day of the week. All the celebrations the day before, the day after, don't make those days our birthday. And the birthday of the world is the seventh day, the day God created and fashioned and shaped as the Holy Sabbath. For in six days the Lord made heavens, the earth, the sea, and all that in them is. See, the Sabbath is a memorial to creation. Every week we have the birthday of the world. God rested the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it every week. When sun sets on a Friday night and Sabbath is ushered in, you and I are invited to come and get a glimpse of eternity. You and I are invited to come into the palace of the king. We can forget about secular employment. We can forget about the noise and the din and the confusion of this world. Jesus wants to enfold us in his arms. And although we work six days, and although he can be present with us each day of the week, the Sabbath is especially made by Jesus to, be, to fellowship with him.
It's especially made by Jesus for us to sense his presence in our lives, to have fellowship with our families, to enjoy the beauties of nature, to reach out in loving acts of kindness to others. Now, the Sabbath was never an exclusively Jewish institution. It was given at creation for all humanity. And throughout the Old Testament, God's people, the Jews, were to reach out to their neighbors and share with them this marvelous gift of God's love as revealed in the Sabbath. In the book of Isaiah, the scripture puts it this way. Isaiah 56, verse six and seven. Everyone, what does it say? Everyone. What does it say again? Everyone. Everyone who keeps from defiling the Sabbath, I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. So here is everyone, all humanity, keeping the Sabbath, coming to the house of prayer, coming to worship. Then it says, for my house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations. So here Isaiah envisions all humanity recognizing that God is creator and coming to worship him. If the Sabbath were kept, there'd never be an atheist in the world. If the Sabbath were kept, we would have universal peace because really the Sabbath is a symbol of universal brotherhood. There would be no war, there'd be no conflict between nations if the Sabbath were rightly kept because we would recognize that all of us, Asians and Africans, Russians and Americans, Chinese, and South Americans, North Korea, we'd recognize that the entire human race was created by God. We'd recognize that we're all part of the family of God, that he's created of one blood all nations. The Sabbath is a symbol of universal brotherhood. The Sabbath is a symbol of universal peace. It's a symbol of coming together and worshiping praising God as one human family. He has set it aside in Genesis for the entire human race. He has given it to his people in the 10 commandment law. And he said, remember the Sabbath. Which of those 10 commandments are exclusively for the Jews? Is the one that says thou shalt not kill? No. Is the one that says thou shalt not commit adultery? No. Is the one that says don't take the name of the Lord thy God in vain only for the Jews? Is the one that says don't worship idols? No. Is the Sabbath? Certainly not. The Sabbath given at creation is his sign that you and I did not evolve. It's his sign that we have worth in his sight and his purpose for our lives. It's the eternal symbol of universal brotherhood in Jesus Christ. Throughout the Old Testament, the Sabbath was God's everlasting sign for all of his people. That's why today he invites all humanity east and west, north and south to come and worship him on the Sabbath. That's why Revelation's last message is Fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come and worship him who made heaven and earth and sea and the fountains of waters. Revelation's last call is a call to worship the creator. In the book of Ezekiel, God distinguishes his Sabbath from all other days. Moreover, I also gave them my Sabbaths to be a sign between, me and, between them and me. You see, the heathens were worshiping the sun god. The Egyptians worshiped Amun-Ra. The Babylonians worshiped Bel-Marduk. The uh, Persians worshiped, they were Mithraists. And uh, the Romans worshiped the goddess of Eternus Verity. So, so they were all sun gods. And as a dis contradistinction to that, in opposition to that, Jesus said, I've given my Sabbath as a sign that they are my people. So the Sabbath is a sign. It's interesting, the Hebrew word Shabbat, Shabbat, Sh comes from an old Persian word called Sair, means aged or eternal. Abba, Abba is father. Shabbat, Bat is or Beth is sign of. So the word Shabbat means the sign of the aged, eternal, everlasting Father. So the Sabbath is the sign of God down through the centuries. Why did he give it? That they might know that I am the Lord that sanctifies them. See, the Sabbath 
is a sign that God created us. It's a sign that Christ redeemed us. We rest in his love and care every Sabbath. But it's a sign also that he has the power of creation to sanctify us. The Sabbath is a sign that just as God created the world, he wants to recreate our hearts. Just like he brought light out of darkness, he wants to bring light out of the darkness of our soul. Just like he brought flowers to perfume the air, so he wants to bring beauty out of our lives. So the Sabbath is a sign that God created us. We rest in Christ, not in our own works. It's a sign that he redeemed us, and it's a sign that he's the all-powerful creator, given by God to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, written on tables of stone with God's own very finger, never to be changed or effaced. What about the New Testament? What does the New Testament say about the Bible Sabbath? Wouldn't you say that Jesus is a positive example? Wouldn't you say that Christ is one who indeed is worthy of following? When you die, your will and testament is settled. So you look to a person's life and you say, what legacy did they leave? What's the will and testament of their life? When you come to Jesus, the Bible says in Luke 4, verse 16, so he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, now don't miss that, as what his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. So Jesus had a custom. What was Jesus' custom? Every Sabbath going to worship. Somebody says, but wait, he was a Jew. Yes, but is there any record in Christ's life alone of him worshiping on any other day beside the Sabbath? There is none. And the Bible says, 1 John chapter 2, 6 to 8, those that follow him ought to walk in his steps. So we walk in the very footsteps of Christ. We follow him to worship each Sabbath. Jesus said in Mark chapter 2, verse 27, the Sabbath was made for who? Man not man for the Sabbath. In other words, the Sabbath was made for all humanity, not made only for the Jew, not made exclusively for the Jew, but it was made for all humanity everywhere. See, the Sabbath is a sign that we worship him exclusively and that we love him supremely. The Sabbath is the sign we acknowledge him as our creator and we also trust in his salvation as our Lord, both to share with us the grace that redeems us from the guilt of sin and the re grace that redeems us from the grip of sin. The grace that redeems us from the penalty of a broken law and the grace that redeems us from the power of a broken law. We rest on the Sabbath in his love, his care, believing in his power to transform our lives. Even in death, Christ kept the Sabbath. You remember he died on a Friday, went into the tomb, and the woman, his closest followers, would not even have embalmed his body on the Sabbath. So certainly, the Sabbath couldn't have been nailed to the cross because Jesus kept it in death and he kept it in life. He says to you and me, John chapter 14, verse 15, if you love me, if you do what, everybody? If you do what? If you love me, do what? Keep my commandments. Does Jesus say, if you love me, you don't have to keep my commandments? Does Jesus say, if you love me, you can do away with the commandments? Not at all. Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commandments. In other words, if you love me, Sabbath keeping, once you understand the significance of what I'm talking about in this presentation, once the Holy Spirit convicts you of it, Sabbath keeping becomes a delight and a joy and you can't wait for the next Sabbath to rest in his love and rest in his care and be transformed by his power. What about after the cross? Is there any evidence that after the cross, Jesus' followers would be keeping the Bible Sabbath? Jesus pointed his disciples down the stream of time. And he said to his disciples, pray that your flight be not in the winter or on the Sabbath. Now he was sitting upon the Mount of Olives, looking across the Kidron Valley, and he saw the temple there at Jerusalem. He described that not one stone was gonna be left unturned, that that temple was gonna be destroyed. And as Jesus talked about the temple being destroyed, he said to his disciples, in that context, pray that your flight be not in the winter or on the Sabbath. The temple was not destroyed until Titus came with the Roman armies in AD 70, and they destroyed that temple. This was approximately 40 years after the cross. 
Now, why did Jesus say, pray that your flight be not on the Sabbath if they wouldn't be keeping the Sabbath 40 years after the cross? Why would Jesus say to Peter, James, and John, his closest apostles and followers, pray that your flight be not on the Sabbath if they would not be keeping the Sabbath? Here's why he said that. He knew that down through the ages, the church would keep the Bible Sabbath down through the first centuries. It was a sign of creation. It was a sign of his love and care. It was a sign they didn't evolve. It was a sign that they were resting in him and being obedient to him, that we were following the command that says, remember the Sabbath. So he knew they would be keeping it. Why did he say, pray your flight, be not in the winter on the Sabbath? Well, winter would be rainy season cold, but the Sabbath, if the Roman armies attacked on Sabbath, where would Christians be? Tend to be in church. It would be far easier for the Roman armies to invade and kill everybody if they were in church. But if it wasn't Sabbath, the believers would be out working in the fields, the Roman armies would come, and they could much more easily flee. History tells us, Josephus, the historian tells us, Jewish historian, that the armies did come surround the city. They were gonna attack on Sabbath, but then held up, waited, did not attack on Sabbath, and the Christians are able to flee Jerusalem. Jesus gave them warning, they prayed, they did not have to flee on Sabbath, and their prayers indeed were answered. But again, why would Jesus say this to his closest followers if they wouldn't be keeping the Sabbath? Here's strong evidence that even after the cross, they'd be keeping the Sabbath. Jerusalem was destroyed in 70 AD and disciples were still keeping the Sabbath at that point. Do we have any evidence of Sabbath keeping in the New Testament or has time ever been lost? Some people have this idea. They say, you know what? Time down through the centuries has been lost. And really we can't tell which day the seventh day is. That's actually not true. There are three ways you can tell which day the seventh day is. You can tell it by the Bible, you can tell it by language, and you can tell it by astronomy. Let's look at the three ways. First, let's try to find out from the Bible what day the seventh day is. You'll recall that the seventh day Sabbath started at creation. So time certainly wasn't lost between creation and the giving of the law, because God said, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, six days shalt thou labor, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. How could God say remember the Sabbath if it was not possible to remember it because time was lost? So certainly there was no time lost between creation and the Ten Commandment law. What about between the Ten Commandment law and Jesus? Well, the Bible says clearly that his custom was Christ kept the Sabbath. So certainly no time was lost then between Moses and the time of Christ. So up until the New Testament time, it's very clear that no time has been lost. Now let's go to the circumstances, the events surrounding the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. In Luke chapter 23, verse 54, onward to Luke 24, verse one, we have three days given in succession. Speaking about the day Christ died on, the Bible says that day was the preparation and the Sabbath drew near. And the women who had come with him from Galilee followed after and they observed the tomb and how his body was laid. And then they returned and prepared spices and fragrant oils and they rested on the Sabbath according to the commandment. Christ's closest followers so reverenced and respected the scriptures and they so desired to keep the commandments of God that they would not even embalm his body on Sabbath. So Jesus dies, it's called the preparation day. Next day is called the Sabbath. The Bible says now on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they and certain others with them came to the tomb bringing spices which they had prepared. And what did they find when they came to the tomb? They found the tomb was empty. So you have three days in succession. Let's look at them. First, you have the preparation day. And what day was it that Christ died on? We call that good what, everybody? Good what? Good Friday, that's right. The next day, Jesus rested in the tomb, the Sabbath, and the day after Friday is, in English, Saturday. And what's the next day, the third day in succession? We find it here, it's Sunday of the first day of the week. 
So there you have it, Luke chapter 24, you have Friday, Saturday, Sunday, the preparation day, the Sabbath day, or the first day of the week. That's the day, of course, that Christ rose from the dead. Crucified on a Friday, rested in the tomb on a Sabbath, rose from the dead on a Sunday. Now somebody says, well, wait a minute, Pastor, we worship on Sunday because Christ rose from the dead on that day. We respect people of every religious persuasion and whatever day they choose to worship on. But here's the point. There are two issues here. One, Jesus never worshiped on Sunday himself, and he never commanded his followers to worship on Sunday. Secondly, he has already given to us a symbol of the resurrection. What is that symbol of the resurrection that Christ has given to us? Did he give us the first day of the week as a symbol of the resurrection? The Bible describes what the symbol of the resurrection actually is. Romans chapter 6, verse 3 and 4. Baptism is the symbol of the resurrection. Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we are buried with him through baptism into death that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we even so, we also should walk in newness of life. In the New Testament, baptism is the symbol of the resurrection. We go under the water. The water covers us. We die just as Jesus died and went into the grave. We rest momentarily. Then we come out to this amazing new life in Jesus Christ. So the Sabbath is a memorial of creation. You see, when you look at those three days, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, how do you commemorate Christ's death? Through the broken bread and the spilled blood. So you commemorate the cross through communion. How do you commemorate how he rested in the tomb? Through keeping the Bible Sabbath. Part of the Ten Commandments written with the finger of God on tables of stone, memorial of the, of the creation. And how do you celebrate Sunday? He died once, he was resurrected once. So we go into the grave, the watery grave, and are resurrected from death. How do you know what day the seventh day really is? First, you know from the Bible, Friday the preparation day, Sabbath the day he rested, Saturday, Sunday the day he was resurrected from the grave. So we know very clearly from those three days in succession. But also we can know from language. In over 140 languages of the world, the word for the seventh day of the week is Sabbath. The many languages do not have the word Saturday. Rather, they use the word Sabbath. Greek, it's Sabaton, it means Sabbath. Spanish, it's Sabado, meaning Sabbath. Portuguese, it's Sabado, meaning Sabbath. Go down to even Russian, Sabata, meaning Sabbath. Go down to Arabic, the last one, as Sabat, meaning Sabbath. In 140 languages in the world, the day that you and I call Saturday is not called Saturday at all, it's called the Sabbath. The languages of the world, the cultures of the world have memorialized the Sabbath as the seventh day of the week. I did some research with the Royal Greenwich Observatory in London, England. The Royal Greenwich Observatory is the leading timekeeping center in all the world. And I wrote to the curator there, the information officer, Robert L. Tucker, at the time, and I asked him about the change of the weekly cycle. He wrote back and said, Pastor Finley, as far as we know down through history, there has never been a change of the weekly cycle. It's always Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, or what we would call the Sabbath. So as you look at it, you, you look back to Jewish history. You know, our, you go back to our Jewish history. Has, have the Jews lost sight of what the seventh day of the week is? Certainly not. There is no question that the seventh day of the week is the day we in English call Saturday. You know, Jesus kept the Sabbath, but so did his apostles after the cross. In Acts chapter 17, verse 1 and 2, the Bible says that the apostle Paul comes to Thessalonica, 
where there's a synagogue of the Jews. And Paul, as his custom was, did Jesus have a custom? He did. Did the Apostle Paul have a custom? He did. And he went in for three Sabbaths and reasoned with them from the scriptures. The Apostle Paul, filled with God's grace, the Apostle of grace, kept the Bible Sabbath. Somebody says he just did that because he was a Jew, so he went into the temple to preach to them then. But notice Acts 13, verse 42, what the Bible says, the Gentiles, who are these? They're not Jews. Begged that these words might be preached to them the next Sabbath. The Gentiles were so moved, so stirred by the power of Paul's preaching, they said, come and preach to us the next Sabbath. What did Paul say? No, you come back the first day of the week, tomorrow Sunday, and I will preach to you. On the next Sabbath day, Almost what? The whole city came together to hear the word of God. So here in the New Testament, you have Jesus keeping the Sabbath. Jesus telling his disciples that after the cross, they would keep the Sabbath. You have the apostle Paul preaching to a whole city on the Sabbath day. The Bible talks also about the Apostle Paul going to find a group of be Jewish believers on the Sabbath out by the riverside in the days of Philippi. And on the Sabbath day, it was special to the Apostle Paul. We went out of the city to the riverside where prayer was customarily made. And we sat down and spoke to the women who met there. Paul left the city, came out to a quiet place on the Bible, Sabbath. The revelation of Jesus Christ calls us back to true worship. It calls us back to worshiping the Creator. The, John puts it this way in Revelation 1, verse 10. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. Somebody says, well, Pastor Mark, there it is. There's the Lord's day. John was keeping the Lord's day. Does this text tell us what day the Lord's day is? It simply tells us the Lord has a day. Some people say it doesn't make any difference what day you keep. This passage tells us that John had his prophetic vision of the book of Revelation that talks about the creator and the conflict between worshiping the creator and worshiping the beast on the Lord's day. What day is the Lord's day? Let's ask Jesus. Jesus, what day is your day? Matthew 12, verse eight. For the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Mark 2, verse 28. Therefore, the Son of Man is also Lord of the Sabbath. Luke 6, verse 5. The Son of Man is Lord also of the Sabbath. Why do you think there's something in the Bible more than once? Why do you think it might be there the three times? You know, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit want to reveal divine truth. And often God has something there more than once. So if you miss it in one place, you pick it up in another place. If you miss it in Matthew, you pick it up in Mark. If you miss it in Mark, you pick it up in Luke. And here the Bible says, the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. In other words, the Sabbath of the Creator God in Genesis is the Lord's Day of Revelation. The Lord's Day indeed is the Sabbath, and the Sabbath is the Lord's Day. So here is a call to all humanity everywhere to get back to keeping the true Bible Sabbath in an age of evolution. Revelation calls us back to keeping the commandments of God, including the Bible Sabbath. Revelation 14, verse 12, here is the patience of the saints. Here are those that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus Christ. Christ in the last days of verse history. Revelation calls all humanity everywhere to keep the commandments of God. In the last days of verse history, Revelation gives us an earnest appeal to worship the Creator. Worship Him on His day, the day that He has set aside, the day that He has blessed, the day that He has sanctified the true Bible, Sabbath. The Sabbath was given at creation. The Sabbath was given again at Sinai when the human beings, the Jewish nation, went into captivity in Egypt. The Sabbath was kept by God's people down through the centuries. The Sabbath was kept 
by Jesus Christ. The Sabbath was honored by the disciples in the New Testament. The Sabbath has always been a sign of God's creative power. As we rest on the Sabbath, we believe in the power of the living God to create this world. We believe in the power of God to sanctify us, to redeem us. We believe in his justifying power to save us, his sanctifying power to transform us, in his glorifying power. We believe that he is coming again and it will keep the Sabbath in a new heaven and a new earth. The Bible puts it this way. Isaiah 66, verse 22 and 23. For as the new heavens and the new earth which I will remake shall remain before me, says the Lord. I'm looking forward to being in that new heavens and new earth, aren't you? Notice what he says. So shall your descendants, your name is gonna be remaining. He goes on, it shall come to pass from one new moon to another. What takes place between one new moon to the next new moon? The tree of life, according to Revelation 22, gives its fruit every month. So we come up to the holy city to get the fruit from the tree of life. From it shall come to pass from one new moon to another and from one Sabbath to another. Shall all flesh come to worship before me, says the Lord. If God gave the Sabbath in Genesis. If he blessed it, sanctified it, and hallowed it. If he wrote it with his own finger on tables of stone. If the Sabbath was the sign between God and his people down through the ages. If Jesus kept the Sabbath, if the disciples kept the Sabbath. If God has a Lord's Day in the book of Revelation and if the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. And if one day we're gonna keep the Sabbath in heaven through all eternity to come to worship and praise Jesus. You think he wants us? to start keeping it now. Wherever you are, my friend, Jesus is inviting you to make that decision. He's inviting you to, to enter into his palace in time. He's inviting you to experience the rest that only he can give, the peace that only he can give. You can be free from anxiety. You can be free from, from the worry and tension of this world. Every Sabbath, you can rest in the loving arms of your creator. Jesus is inviting all humanity to come as brothers and sisters. Put down the weapons of war. Put down conflict and strife. Put down the tension between nations. He's inviting them to come on the Sabbath as a symbol of universal brotherhood. He's inviting you to rest on the Sabbath. Rest in his love and care. Rest from that guilt and that shame. He's inviting us on Sabbath to know that he can change our hearts, that the one that created us can recreate us. And this Christ is inviting us to look to that new heavens and the new earth where he will recreate the Garden of Eden again. It was a secret baptism in a Hindu country. I met her. She didn't come from a Hindu background. She came from a Buddhist background. She was Chinese and had come to that particular country. And there in that country, this Chinese businesswoman began looking for truth. There was something missing in her life, something that she longed for. She began to read the Bible and she found Jesus. She found the one that could give her peace, the one that could give her joy, the one that could give her meaning. But as she studied the Bible, she found there in scripture in Genesis that God had blessed the Sabbath, that God had sanctified it, that God had rested upon the Sabbath. She found in the 10 commandment law, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. She found that the Sabbath in Ezekiel 20 was a sign between God and his people. She saw Christ kept the Sabbath. And she found the Sabbath as the sign of the Creator in the book of Revelation. She didn't know anybody in the world that kept the Sabbath. She didn't think anybody did. And she said, I'm going to begin to keep the Sabbath. I have to trust Jesus. She said, it's so sweet to trust Jesus. One day she was walking down the street, saw a sign for the Adventist church, Seventh-day Adventist. She said, these must be Sabbath keepers. And she came in and found fellowship with God's believing people because she had the confidence and the faith and the courage to trust in Jesus. Why don't you make that decision to trust Jesus as Tim sings. Tis so sweet 
to trust in Jesus just to take him at his word just to rest upon his promise just to know thus saith the Lord Jesus Jesus how I trust him how I've proved him o'er and o'er Jesus Jesus precious Jesus oh for grace to trust him more oh how sweet to trust in Jesus just to trust his cleansing blood and in simple faith to plunge me neath the healing cleansing flood yes tis sweet to trust in Jesus just from sin and self to cease just from Jesus simply taking life and rest and joy and peace Jesus Jesus how I trust him how And over and o'er Jesus Jesus precious Jesus oh for grace to trust him more. Jesus is inviting you to step out from tradition to step out from popular convention to trust him have you sensed God working in your life it's no accident that you've turned into this telecast tonight this afternoon this morning it's no accident that God has led you here the Spirit of God has brought you to this telecast at this moment maybe the Sabbath is new to you but you see the evidence in the Bible that God created this world in six days and rested the seventh that his people down through the ages have kept the Bible Sabbath written with his finger on tables of stone you see that Jesus kept the Sabbath and that revelation is calling all humanity back to to worshiping the Creator you see it's more than a matter of days it's a matter of trusting Jesus it's more than a matter of when you worship. It's really a matter of who you worship. Will you fully, completely trust Jesus and worship your creator? Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we sense the moving of the Spirit of God on our hearts. For some of us, this is new. But we thank you that we can trust you, that we can rest in your love and care we thank you that you'll give us the strength and power to follow you now and forever. In Jesus' name, amen. I look forward to having you with us in our continued series on Revelations, Ancient Discoveries.